I just want to thank everybody at Amoka for all the hard work in completing the space and setting up such a wonderful show and um, thank you everybody. Uh, what a great job, what a great space and I am pleased and honored to be the first exhibition in this space. So um, I'm going to try to make this as linear as possible and I think um, it makes better sense that way, but it's, keep in mind that not everything is in the correct order. So I try to talk about my work in terms of my own experiences, and in a lot of ways my work is an attempt for me to try to make sense of the world around me. Um, and what I've realized over time is that sometimes the process of trying to understand something is more important than actually understanding it. So as Beth had mentioned, I went to Alfred University, um, which is in Southern Tier, New York State, and it is literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the closest towns are Buffalo, which is two hours away, and then Rochester, which is almost two hours away. And it was kind of a blessing and a curse because, you know, in graduate school, you're supposed to buckle down and really, you know, find yourself in school and the lack of anything to do there for the most part really helped achieve that. While I was at school, um, one of my professors, a woman named Ann Courier, uh, curated a show called, it was Architectural Terracotta from Boston Valley Terracotta, which was actually located in upper New York. I don't know why they call it Boston Valley Terracotta. Uh, it was called Defying Gravity. And one of the things that struck me was these objects were beautiful, taken out of the context of being on a building, but I also started to think of them as codified ideology, uh, specifically neoclassical humanism. So most of you probably recognize the Vitruvian section uh, on your left, which is, you know, this is Michelangelo's famous re reproduction of it. Uh, the Vitruvian section was uh, made by a man named Vitruvius, who was a Greek, and it asserted that man was the measure of all things uh, because he fit neatly into the geometric forms of the circle and the square. Um, in truth, that was fudged. It doesn't work at all. Um, da Vinci had to move the square upwards and, you know, cheat it in a bunch of ways to make it look as though that it did work. So it was my first sort of interest in ideology applied to the body. Uh, upper corner, um, you see, this is the New York Stock Exchange and below is the Capitol Building. And there's this belief, you know, that America is sort of the um, purveyor of, you know, the new Greek ideology, like we are the continuation of that movement. So this piece is called Facade, and it's from 1997, and you, I think you can just barely make it out. It has the Vitruvian section literally inflicted onto the torso, and then kind of playing with that Victorian convention of removing the genitalia and replacing it with a fig leaf. But I was doing it with architectural terracotta. So this is a really old piece, but it was sort of the beginning of something that I started to go with. So after graduate school, I moved to New York City. And it was actually the best place for me. I moved there with my then girlfriend, who is now my wife, and it was like having six more years of graduate school. And if I think if I only had one image to talk about my work and I couldn't actually show my work, it would be this image. And I think a lot of people would look at this and they just see graffiti on the wall, but I see this two ide ideologies existing in the same space, old and new, and the mark of the individual kind of in conflict with the mark of society. Um, so one thing I've kind of realized over the last 20 years is that my work oftentimes is about a tension between two different things. 
So this is my E-Train commute um, to work every day to my first job in New York, which was at Greenwich House Pottery. And, you know, in a larger city, there is a different understanding of space. And, you know, you could be on the subway train and literally, you know, touching five different people, but you never acknowledge those people that are around you. Whereas in the countryside, you know, if you are your neighbors from 10 miles away, if, if that's your nearest neighbor, are going to make it a point to know exactly who you are. So there's this idea that you're sort of more I isolated in a large crowd uh, than you might be in a small town. So this is a pe first piece in the series I did. This piece is from uh, 1999, and it's a piece called Anonym. And so it's influenced by architectural ornament, but unlike monuments to specific individuals, uh, identity is obscured by the ornament. This piece is called Reclinatus, also from late 90s. And so I started thinking about this, you know, society is something that we build collectively, but it's sort of are forced to experience individually. This piece is called Stricture. And so, essentially, by removing the identity of these things, it's almost as though I was building these, these sort of monuments to anonymity. This piece is called Equilibrium. And I, I begin to sort of see these as an open-ended question. Um, you know, how do we, as individuals, fit into this larger context of society? This piece is called Bud. And I really like the sort of prudish nature of like how it's kind of concealing the inside portion of its body. And building this piece was kind of like building a ship in a bottle. <laughs> and this piece is called Impediment. Uh, and it's sort of a word play on, architectural, on an architectural pediment of a building. And so this is the piece that's in the Smithsonian. Uh, and it was taken in in 2000. Five, and it looked as though you know everything was going great and my career was doing really great and I had all the right people interested in the work and then I did something I changed what I was doing and then I found out who my friends really were at that point <laughs> um, so literally overnight from you know not the next few pieces I'm going to show you but the body of work after that is what I moved to that basically morphed into the work you're going to see in the show here. Um, for instance, my gallery in Philadelphia at the time said that two of these very important people came in and they saw the new work and he said they left in an argument. <laughs> and these are, these are you know, important collectors. They actually helped get the piece into the Smithsonian and that's not really a good sign. So I, you know, I, was, I, I still look back on that time and I think about, you know, is it more important um, to have a career or to, as cliche and kind of cheesy as it sounds, like be true to yourself and like really believe in what you make. Um, so in 2004, skipping backwards just a little bit, I was a visiting artist at CAFA, which is Central Academy of Fine Art in Beijing. And I was also there because my wife uh, worked for a snowboard company based in Vermont. And so there was, uh, an overlap for manufacturing, so I went there specifically with her, but then also I was invited to go speak at this, uh, at CAFA. So I started thinking about these European imitations of Chinese export wear. Um, they're called chinoiserie, and here's a bowl, a chinoiserie plate uh, from the time period, and what it is is that the Europeans started creating copies of the Chinese export wares for their own markets, but then the Chinese began to see the work that the Europeans were making and make the copy of a copy. <laughs> so I realized this, and I was thinking about this, this was, in a sense, this was the first artistic crystallization of what we now call globalization. Um, so I started this body of work called the Fruits of Labor series, and this piece is called Growth. And a lot of the objects I chose um, they're associated with growth and nourishment through their, do their domestic roles as planters and food receptacles. 
And I started thinking about how you know, trade and consumerism are also forms of growth. So in some regards, the work was an attempt to reconcile different interpretations of the word growth. And obviously, you know, what is good for industry is not always good for the individual or the environment. So this piece is called Structure. And there's this you know, symbol of Western affluence, and it's precariously balanced on top of this Chinese tea bowl. Hmm. So this, you know, for me, I was thinking, you know, about contemplating our sort of mutual fears and desires uh, concerning globalization and its social and economic outcomes. But the funny thing is, I was making this work 11, almost 12 years ago, and I feel like, it, you know, a lot of the things I was thinking about in the work and speaking about were more, you know, are even truer now, today, than they were 11, 12 years ago. Um, so this piece is called Towers, and I also kind of view the work as uh, reestablishing the sort of importance uh, of the artists in the presence of industry, and you know, establishing a dialogue between the handmade and the mass-produced. What's interesting is you know, 11 years have gone by and things have changed so much even since then, because now you know, with the advent of CNC, and 3D printing and all of these things that are more accessible to the masses, the bars to production are lowered every day, so now everybody can be an artist. Um, so I was thinking about all these sort of things. Um, production, consumption, mm -hmm. and this work started to turn towards <laughs> consumption. Um, thinking about the resources we consume, Below that is a picture of Zeus and Amalthea. Above that is uh, a cornucopia that you guys have probably seen before. It's like, so the story of the cornucopia says, basically it's a Greek story about Zeus and the goat Amalthea playing in a cave while he was hiding from his father Kronos. And while they were playing, Zeus accidentally ripped off the horn of the goat. So it's, it's kind of as an apology, he gave the horn the ability to produce an eternal abundance you know, forever. And so taking that idea, I kind of did this play on words, and the piece of mine is on your right. It's called Discopia. So it's a wordplay on utopia and um, a dystopia and a cornucopia, which is, you know, a cornucopia, everything comes out, and in this piece, everything goes in and gets turned into something else. So again, this is sort of a, a, a stepping piece towards some other work. So in thinking about consumption, uh, I was looking at Dutch still lives, and these still lives, the one up in the corner there, um, this is a butcher shop scene, and in the background, there's a religious scene where the Virgin Mary is handing out alms to the poor. And you might not realize it, but a lot of these, you know, they seem like just genre settings, but they actually have deep religious undertones. And they're actually meant to serve as a warning um, against the futility of earthly pursuits and acquisitions, you know, that you're going to die. So really, it's kind of a futile thing to sort of concern yourself with riches and all, you know, acquiring objects and things. So they're, you know, they're very much about austerity. That's how they started out. And around <coughs> 1500, um, they started, there was, a, there was a rising middle class in Northern Europe. And so all of these religious undertones started to disappear. And they became instead just simply what they were. You know, a vase of flowers no longer represented anything religious. It became a vase of flowers. Uh, so there was this contradiction that was sort of forewarning the viewer about the dangers of consumption, but at the same time, they became the same objects that they were warning you against, uh, which I found very interesting. Um, so below that is a. Um, a Meissen terrine from 18, 1800. 
And so, you know, there's a symmetry, there's this beauty to these things, and they're porcelain, they're overly ornate, and there's these two things kind of couldn't be further from each other. So I was looking for a way to kind of combine, you know, what it is that's kind of repulsive and attractive in the same piece. And so, you know, like the Vanitas still lives, my work uses food as a metaphor for consumption. And I started working under this premise that, you know, people say less is more, but in this work, more is more. And that's what I was kind of working for in the work. I think I heard it coined once as somebody wrote about it. They called it beautifully horrible. <laughs> and so trying to subvert the iconography of beauty and a decorative object um, to engage the viewer to think about these things. So symmetry is, is one of the things that I was using, and you know we're all kind of hardwired to recognize symmetry, especially in the, in, the, in the face or body of a potential mate. And so this piece is called Bounty, and there's a little bit of a word play there on, you know, a bounty is obviously a great harvest, but it is also potentially like a, a price on your head. So this piece is called Commemoration, and you know, whether it's a birth, a wedding or a wake, uh, there's always food, there's always celebration with food. And so a lot of these pieces, the uh, arrangements are informed by this mundane ritual of eating that is long celebrated in ceramics. Um, mm -hmm. But unlike the potter whose you know, dishes that per they present an opportunity, my work kind of comes pre-arranged with these um, opulent inedible meals that are both simultaneously beautiful and disgusting. So this piece is called Swan Song, and it's actually in the show. And this was the last piece in this vein that I made, and it actually never, it never got shown in a sale setting because I was in between shows and I started changing what I was doing. So it's, luckily I still have this piece, and the rest of them are all gone. Um, so the title Swan Song refers to this, another Greek myth. They used to believe that swans never made a sound until the day they died. And then the day they died, they would sing the most beautiful song you ever heard. And there's also, so for me, it was a way of sort of harnessing this idea of an ending. <clears throat> this piece is called Propagation. I'm using a mold process, uh, replication, that kind of reminds me of you know replication of animals in agribusiness. So kind of trying to touch on this idea about excessive food production is responsible for larger populations. This piece is called Stagger. Um, and it's to arrange in a zigzag order or to falter or begin to give way. So I also was, this piece from 2008, and thinking about this um, this was uh, this idea of like also civility sort of upending. And at this time, there were the first sort of grumblings about the whole deck of cards getting ready to collapse. And I thought I was being all super witty and um, you know, psychic about like, I'm gonna represent this in pastries. Uh, so this piece is called Cataclysm. And it was the first piece where there was a potential action. You know, you felt as though something was getting ready to happen. So I really like this idea of alluding to destruction through something as benign as a, as a pastry. So in 2010, the Bellevue Arts Museum in Bellevue, Washington uh, held an open call for the Bellevue Biennial. And I had gotten into the show and I got to see the space and so I decided that I was going to kind of challenge myself to make something that didn't sit on a pedestal, something that actually occupied the space, that it was thought out to be in that space. And I wanted to push myself beyond anything I'd ever done before. So this piece works with the public scale of a museum instead of the private sort of scale of the personal, you know, consumable object. And The title of this piece is My Beautiful Nothing. 
And it's a contradiction, you know, sort of a, a polarities that embody life and death, beautiful, the ugly, fragile, enduring, art, craft. And so for me, this like, this way of embracing paradox was an attempt to reveal space in between, like maybe true or false. So I was trying to do something, trying to get at something maybe a little more metaphysical, and I don't mean like in a, in a you know crystal patchouli way, but I mean something more deep and substantial. Uh, so in the piece, you know, there's this one hollow section in the bottom, and this piece is actually in the next room. And so this this meant for this space to kind of be a stand-in for this transcendent idea or a focal point or contemplation for this idea. So I had um, about 18 months. So I, so I won the Bellevue Biennial, and so I got a solo show out of winning. So I had a space, a really big space, that I had to fill in 18 months. And I wanted to, again, push myself in scale in a way that I never had. But at the time, um, I was reading this book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And in the book, a talking gorilla teaches man about humanity and dispels progress as an illusion that comes at great cost. So one of the things he talks about is uh, he makes this, this comparison between early aviators uh, mistaking free fall for flight. And so the title for my show became flying feels a lot like, or falling feels a lot like flying. And so I had a couple of, you know, questions that were sort of rolling around in my head. Um, one of which is like, how much is enough? And is there a tipping point where too little becomes too much? So I had to make five pieces in 18 months, um, and I wanted to expand on the previous work in scale and meaning and challenge myself with what was possible in the medium of sculpture and ceramics. And I also wanted to try to link um, this visual perception of trompe l'oeil or trompe l'oeil for American um, to the perception of vanitas painting and public perception of consumption. So in a lot of these works, everything was sort of balanced precariously and they would give you the feeling as though Everything was on the brink of disaster. So this piece is called Confectional Facade, and it's probably just over eight feet tall, but it's only nine inches wide. And it looks as though it's balanced on two little points that are about four feet apart, like this, but it has this feeling that it's gonna fall over. And I had several people tell me that um, they were very nervous around the piece, and it was exactly the sort of, I wanted to give this feeling as though this thing could kill you, even though it was kind of silly in its construction. Um, so, confectional facade, there's different meanings associated with confection that I kind of like where they take you. Um, one is obviously candy or sugar-based product. Another is something frivolous. And the third is something it's more akin to a lie. So confecting is also kind of like stretching the truth. Um, so this work kind of took you this place of fear and desire. So you know you wanted to get closer to it, but at the same time, the, the feeling that it might topple over and hurt you kind of kept you away. And then here's the back of the piece. And then, so this piece was the first piece where I kind of started realizing the power of, of a facade or changing direction really quick, you know, having something that was very voluptuous and then turning to something that was naked and, you know, not as appealing, but it's actually the same piece. So this is a wishing well with a fountain in it. And I started thinking about the nature of a wish, and there are two kinds of wishes. There's that kind of frivolous wish for you know, material wealth, you know, things that you desire and probably don't need. And then there's that wish that's sort of more like 
out of desperation, it's more like a, a prayer, um, you know, where you're trying to get out of some situation that's beyond your control. So this piece is called Wishing Well, Knowing Otherwise, and it's based, you know, on similar to a, a fountain and a sculpture and a um, wishing well at the base. So there's these gold gilded wares, sugar confections on the top. Um, and for me, the cake is this, it's a specious object that sort of tantalizes the senses, but is harmful in most every other respect. So it's the perfect metaphor or vehicle for thinking about obsessive or um, excessive consumption. This piece is called A Consuming Allegory. It's also in the show. And there's a, you know, a bit of a moralizing parable in here related to the goose that laid the golden egg. Mm. You know, destroying the thing that sustains you. Um, so a consuming allegory on one hand is an allegory about consuming, but on the other hand it's also an allegory that might consume you. This piece is called No Strings Attached. And there's you know, this implication that there's no obligations or requirements involved, but the very weight, you know, this is a pretty large piece and it, there's more of that sort of trickery there where it looks as though the whole thing is held up by one tiny nail. And so the implications being that there are strings attached both literally and figuratively. So I started I started backing away um, from thinking about the work started to, you know, it was me kind of thinking through some things and thinking about my own relationship to consumption and all of that. And I, I was worried that maybe I was being a little too preachy or like, you know, um, putting those things out there in a way that maybe I didn't want to. Um, so. This piece is a detail from a piece called Let, Let Them Eat Cake, which is also in the show next door. And so on a personal level, I started thinking about, you know, I grew up in a decidedly middle class affair. And, but the one thing that my mom sort of had for her was that this, that demarcated status was her China collection, you know. It was the good China, it only came out when important people came over, and it you know conferred this status in her mind that we had, but we really didn't have. And um, so I started thinking about you know if these objects denote status, does the loss of those objects require a change in status? So obviously, you know the nature of a still life is objects at rest in a static pose. So I, again, like that sort of paradox, this idea of a violent repose. So it's stuck in between being still and in motion at the same time. So without a frame of reference, you know, people would see, like I had people ask me if like, okay, you took a photo of throwing the stuff and you caught it. And I was like, no, that's, that's the sculpture. So you have to, a lot of my work, the recent work, you have to explain it because there is an illusion sort of happening with the sculpture. Um, and around this time, I started thinking about my own verisimilitude and my ability to craft things. And it seemed that, you know, that's the sort of thing that I was either being really highly praised for or punished for. And perhaps punished because some people look upon that like as maybe a crutch. So I was working on this piece, and now we're, we're linear again, and trying to figure out how to end this piece. And you can see there's a dramatic difference between the top and the bottom. And I was trying to figure out how to end it and how that ending might influence the piece. Um, and so what I decided is like, why not let the meaning of the piece come from what I don't do? So the bottom of the piece is extremely, you know, it's sculpted with a lot of care, a lot of craft, a lot of detail. And then as I worked my way up the piece, I kind of 
just tried to channel what I imagined my you know three-year-old daughter might sculpt when I asked her to sculpt a bird, and I worked just as quickly as I could. And so this piece was kind of an exercise in letting go of control. And the name of the piece is called Birds in Hand, because one bird is never enough. And this, this piece is also a sh kind of the beginning of a shift in my work. So more Vanitas painting. <clears throat> so in the Vanitas symbolism, um, the skull is called a memento mori and it's a reminder of death. Uh, the watch that you see there is a reminder of how short our time is here. The flowers are a reminder that you, you know, you may be beautiful now, but you're going to wilt and fade away. So there's all these, you know, uplifting ideas that are <laughs> present in these paintings. And what I realized was, you know, these are all religious in nature, Christian specifically. But these paintings all confer this idea or belief that the world that we live in is somehow less real um, than the one that awaits. So it was this modulation between real and imagined that started to interest me, um, real and illusionistic. And I think ultimately makes my work about perception. <laughs> so this is a New Yorker cartoon um, that's based on the work of M.C. Escher. A lot of you are probably familiar with his work. But what I like about like, this as a reference is um, he takes what's possible in a picture um, There's this gap between what's possible in a picture and in a three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So that he finds a kind of loophole in dimensions. And you know, looking at this work, I feel like the work that I start creating after the piece I showed you before this is kind of working the other way. I'm working from flat stuff and then making it dimensional. So this is the work of Cornelius Gish Gishbrecht from 1670. And so this is a Temploy painting um, of the back of a painting, mm -hmm. which I find really amazing and insightful <laughs> and actually full of humor. Um, I mean, for 1670, this is amazingly contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, and what I also like about this is that he's giving attention and importance um, to something that normally goes unseen. So in my studio, I was usually you know, in such a rush, like I had it all figured out. I thought I knew what I was doing for the longest time. And I think everybody who works in a medium for a really long period of time gets really comfortable with what they're doing. And so I, you know, I was in this new phase. I was a little freaked out. I was trying to figure out where I was going to take the work and started as cliche as it sounds, this idea of paying attention in the moment. Um, I had just strung up a new canvas on a board for this clay, so it was brand new canvas, and I had rolled out some slabs. For those of you who are familiar with clay, you know, you roll out a slab if you're going to use it, and you can cut it up and do all these things with it. What I had realized was, as I was cutting this up, I stopped and I looked at what you're seeing right there, and I was like, I don't know how many times I've seen this over the last 20 something years, but there was this aha moment um, that every action has a potential record of that action or reaction. Um, so I started thinking about the work I would made before was mostly allegorical and what would it be like to include another layer, which is like what I would call an allegory of process. So I started, I went to a, a rebuilding center and bought all this scrap wood and um, symbolically the first thing that I did is I 
got this old door jam, so I created this sort of passageway, metaphorically, in the, in the mold that I was making. So I created a box, you know, screw, you know, cut these four sections of wood, screwed them together. And I was trying to get to a place where I didn't really know what I was doing, because like I said before, I was so comfortable doing what I had been doing. So it was a little scary, a little exciting, and you know, it, we'll see where it goes. So I wanted to create a process where there was a sort of blind making that prevented my understanding of what was being created, sort of limiting my skill like intentionally limiting my skill. So the forms are sculpted from the front to the back. And you know, there's an old cliche about, you know, thinking outside the box. Well, I needed a box at this particular point in time in my making. So here's a piece, this piece is called translation number one. And it's a translation of a painting to a sculpture, not an actual literal painting, but little influenced by painting and what's interesting to me is that ultimately we never see most of the work in person you know it's mostly a flat image of that work so somebody works really hard to make a sculpture but all you're ever really going to see is an image and so there's this conditioning of the frame that we're so used to that once this goes from imaginary image to sculpture back to image again that you see here and other people have seen in catalogs and press and all that stuff is that it becomes flat again and that created a very interesting kind of funny problem in that the shows I've had with this work people call up the gallery or someone else and they're like so you there's paintings by so-and-so and they're like well no they're sculptures and I said, well, no, they look like paintings. And it's like, well, you got to just come see and you'll, you'll understand. So here's a detail from that piece. <clears throat> so I want to explore the space in between sculpture and painting that neither of those mediums can occupy alone. Um, you look behind a painting, the illusion of space is lost. I want to give that space a tangible form. So this is the back of the piece that I showed you that I built in the box. So sculpture lacks a true narrative form and that it has no real beginning or end. Um, it asserts meaning through metaphor, irony, simile, those sort of things, etc. Uh, I wanted to create a narrative of creation and expose how something was made. So this piece is called Translation Number Two. It's currently on view at the Portland Art Museum. And it's the only piece that I ever used a real, like a found frame. And I have really mixed feelings about that because I'm already dealing with something, um, it's kind of iconic, the frame. You know, there's already a bunch of feelings and associations with that. And so the, there creates this huge challenge for me as an artist to sort of reinvigorate something that's potentially trite. Um, you know, maybe taking something that most everybody's given up on and trying to make it new. So here's the back of that piece. And it's a pretty large piece that's probably a little over four feet tall. And one thing I liked about working this way is that the backs were a surprise to me. I never quite knew what they were going to look like as I'm making them. And at the time I was sharing these with a friend of mine, uh, I was sending him pictures via the phone. And so he was showing them to his like six year old daughter. And it was interesting because the fronts, she thought they were amazing. You know, she was like, Oh daddy, that's great. He's, you're, Uncle Dirk's a great artist, you know? And then she sees the back, and she's like, not so much. Um, so there's like, there's this conditioned appreciation that is, you know, more apparent in children than in adults, because we can add this other layer that when you appreciate something conceptually, it adds another layer to the work of appreciation that you might not have, you know, 
give it a second thought before. The best example would be a Mondrian. I used to hate Mondrian. And then I found out all of the ideas behind his work, and I thought, oh, it's brilliant. So this piece is called Translation Number Three. And all the pieces before this one um, were made in that flat manner that I had described earlier. Um, but I wanted to increase the amount of depth to get a true, you know, a truer, darker feeling of that vacuous space that's in the Vanitas still life paintings. So the resulting forms that came from these were like these sculptural breaths. Um, and the back is a direct reflection of everything going on in the front where everything's exposed. And so in a way, representation becomes a means for me to sort of improvise the backs of these. Um, so working fast and there's a direct sort of that same difference between the naked clay and then the extremely finely worked surfaces in the front. I love that sort of completely alien worlds. You know, one minute I'm giving a deaf poetry slam and then the sec next second I'm like speaking French. So I really like that sort of juxtaposition of those two different feelings. So I began to think of these as, this piece is called Soliloquy Number One. And I began to think of these more like stages with actors on them. And a soliloquy is basically to talk out loud. There's this idea of talking out loud when you're by yourself. So in a sense, I thought I'd start thinking of myself as making out loud by myself in my studio. And in a play or a movie, when a character does a soliloquy, it has this feeling of them breaking character as though they're talking directly to you, which is exactly what these pieces do. They break character as you walk around them. So they reveal this sort of side that you would never see. This is soliloquy number two. It's the front and that's the back. I also had this idea that the work was sentient and not sentient like you or I, you know, it doesn't think deeply or have feelings of self-awareness, but um, it does express an awareness of its own constructs. So at this point, representation becomes a departure point for investigating these other forms that are created in the back, almost like the residue of representation. This piece is called Soliloquy Number Three. And so I believe, you know, that the act of how something is formed imbues meaning. And the relation of what is fully formed and what is left unfinished expresses that meaning. So in essence, in a nutshell, what these do on one level is it contrasts perceptions of taste, ability, and worth. So you can see here, um, I actually made all everything in here. It's not a found um, Ming Dynasty vase. It is actually one that I made from scratch. And then actually, you know, fired all these different clay bodies that aren't supposed to go together, together. And then every action on the front from representation has that opposite reaction on the back. So all of those little finger-like structures that are coming out the back are actually how the flowers are held in place on the front. <clears throat> so in 2014, I started making a piece called Handmade 3D Print. Um, and I noticed there were these similarities between the way that a ceramic artist would build with coils and a way a 3D printer would build something. Since then, actually, at, right about the time I was making this, I saw that somebody had developed a 3D printer and now they're, they're becoming ubiquitous. So I challenged myself to build a sculpture exactly like a 3D printer. So building up each layer, each coil, back and forth. And I think a lot has been said about 3D printing and the next wave of technology. And 
I have a couple of questions, you know, that I, that I ask myself, and it's like, how will this new tech technology change the way we understand the handmade? Um, will it improve or diminish the handmade? And I don't have answers to these questions, but like, I feel that by making this piece, it was a way of me sort of meditating on these ideas. And I think that artists are always going to find new and interesting ways to use new tools. Uh, two artists that are actually using 3D printing in, in a very innovative ways um, would be Walter McConnell and another artist named Del Harrow. But there's a big but here. Um, I think that most people are going to go with what's easiest. And I'll use the analogy um, of an ecosystem. Uh, the introduction of a superior species will always supplant the indigenous species. So I don't think it's going to happen overnight, and I think there's going to be a lot of interesting questions and a lot of cool change, and we're going to get to see a lot of things. And the, I don't really know, but I know one thing, the, the only way is forward. So here's the finished piece. Um, so what's the difference between art and craft? And it's one of those questions that I've always asked myself, but I've never really known how to approach it because I work in a medium that's kind of, there's been, it's been considered a craft medium, but I've always considered myself a fine artist. And so I read this quote the other day, well, a month back by Tony Marsh and said, to be a crafter is to pursue the betterment of culture, to look back lovingly and to reassure, to make art is to critique, subvert, question, to create doubt, and to move forward. And I liked that. You know, it makes sense to me on a lot of levels. And I think my work does a little bit of both. Um, but I think deep down inside my heart, I want to be a, a crafter. So this piece is called Flux Number One. And in the lineage of my work, it's as though I'm actually moving backwards towards my inspiration. It's like I jumped way away from my inspiration for the early work, and now I'm moving backwards towards it. Um, so I wanted to make process an active player in my work, but I also wanted pr process to participate in a piece both formally and conceptually. So in the past, working in ceramics was kind of a means to an end, and I wanted these things to look a certain way, and I had a plan for how they were gonna work. What's changed is, is I want to give the process more say in the work and take away, take away more of my say and give it over to the process. So this series is called the Flux series, and it's basically paintings, Vanitas, still life paintings, but done with glaze. So, the flux is a melt when we're talking about clay and glaze. It's the ingredient or process that causes glass and things to run and to melt. Uh, in relation to Vanitas still life painting, um, it's change. It's change from life to death. So letting process undo what I have done is sort of the modus operandi for these pieces. This piece is called uh, Flux Number Four, and there's a, a futility in Vanitas painting that I spoke about earlier, and I wanted to find a way to turn that futility into an artistic gesture. What what does futility look like as an artistic gesture? Um, I wanted to render what was representational and static in the fluid medium of glaze, um, knowing that what is painstakingly depicted is going to change beyond my control once it's subjected to the process of firing. Um, so it, it captures this fleeting moment that's reminiscent of the temporal nature of life presented in the Vanitas paintings. <clears throat> this is flux number two. And ironically, we know, you know fired ceramic to be one of the most permanent materials that we know of. It is, and we learn a lot from past societies about the scraps and the pieces of shards that are left, you know, some of these dating back 
30, 40,000 years. So to talk about impermanence in the medium of ceramics, for me, becomes a gesture of optimism. So this is the last piece. Um, for me, personally, I've, I've come to the conclusion that the only meaning in life comes from where you decide to make it. Otherwise, life is meaningless. You have to assert your own meaning in life. Um, so for me, the act of creation gives meaning of, to life, and in a sense, futility gives way to optimism. Thank you.